we are now at uh, 1100 hours and I would like to uh, begin uh, this uh, event uh, by firstly wishing you all a very good morning. I wish to extend a very warm welcome to all of you listening in to this year's annual K. Subramaniam Memorial Lecture. We are commemorating the 11th anniversary uh, of the passing of this Colossus uh, who strode the strategic scene in India for many years. The anniversary actually fell on uh, 2 February, that is yesterday. I particularly welcome Dr. Edward N. Lutwak, our eminent keynote speaker who will deliver the memorial lecture today. I also warmly welcome Dr. S. Jayashankar, the External Affairs Minister of India, and Mr. Dhruva Jayashankar, grandson uh, uh, of the late K. Subramaniam. Uh, in a way, they are both uh, uh, chips of the old block. Um, and it's uh, uh, our great fortune uh, that uh, the both of them have found time to attend uh, on behalf of the family. Uh, I will also request uh, uh, both uh, Dr. S. Jayashankar and Mr. Dhruva Jayashankar to uh, come in and uh, uh, express their uh, thoughts. Uh, in particular, Mr. Dhruva Jayashankar will deliver the vote of thanks on behalf of the extended family. The topic of the lecture by Mr. Uh, Lutwak, Dr. Edward Lutwak, is applying the case Subramaniam method today. Now, I do not purport to preempt the speaker, but I do wish to share a few thoughts, uh, if only to lay the uh, framework for his uh, thoughtful remarks, which will follow. Uh, friends, the world has changed much since the global financial and economic crisis in 2008, uh, but I would uh, venture to say that it has changed even more uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. China's economic rise has been accompanied by coercive military policies. Uh, it appears that it has arrogated to itself monopoly over critical supply chains, the right to interpret the practice of democracy uh, as well uh, as the right to treat the region as its bailiwick. Some of uh, China's current actions uh, seem to run counter to its own long-term interests. All this has been going on for quite some time, but it took a while for the United States to finally call a spade a spade. President Biden's recommitment to the transatlantic alliance has helped evolve a better consensus on China. Parallelly, the US departure from Afghanistan and the crisis over Ukraine have exposed fissures between the United States and its European allies. Across the pond, Europe is a divided house. Germany post Merkel has its own take on European defense and security. NATO expansion is grating against Russian sensitivity. Russia's deployment of troops to Kazakhstan under the CSTO framework suggests a confident comeback as a regional security provider. The current preoccupation in the US and Europe with Ukraine is perhaps a distraction from the real challenges emerging in the Indo-Pacific. Friends, we live in an increasingly complex world. It is neither unipolar nor bipolar nor is it yet fully multipolar. Major UN reforms have evaded consideration even as multilateralism has weakened. At the ground level, power is fractured. There's no doubt about that. States and non-state uh, actors have acquired asymmetrical means to bridge absolute gaps in military and economic heft. Dr. Lutwak's 1990, uh, 1990 beg your pardon, essay titled From Geopolitics to Geoeconomics, Logic of Conflict, grammar of commerce comes to mind when we look at the growing intersection today of political, military, and economic factors, particularly their impact on peace and security. Events such as the end of the unipolar decade suggest that geoeconomics matter, but do not outweigh in importance the harsh realities of geopolitics. In hindsight, uh, one might say that Dr. Lutwak's essay seems prescient. Uh, truly, in the case of uh, the US-China relationship, their mutual economic interdependence has not prevented the aggravation of geostrategic contestation. The converse is perhaps equally true. The absence of friction does not necessarily guarantee a robust trade and economic partnership. Such is the independent logic of the world of business. A great irony of our times is that China's rise has been facilitated in no small measure by the United States and its European allies. There is a fundamental rethink now 
but it is akin to shutting the barn door after the horse has bolted. Coming back to China, its debt diplomacy, stranglehold over critical supply chains, its unilateralism and military aggression in the context of territorial differences are features that arouse widespread concern. In the Indo-Pacific, there is a growing consensus on ensuring a rules-based order and a free and open maritime space. Both the quadrilateral security dialogue and the more specifically defense-oriented AUKUS Pact are manifestations of new concerns. In our region, Afghanistan is no closer to peace and stability now than it was two decades ago. The specter of internal turmoil and the threat of terrorism emanating from Afghanistan loom large. It is amidst all this that we seek to interpret the K. Subramaniam method. How would Mr. K. Subramaniam have assessed the current geostrategic churn? Strategic realism and nationalistic approaches have found new traction in a globalized world battered by the pandemic. And today, as India's strategic autonomy and issue-based alignment are in the limelight, one can also say with confidence that Kautilian precepts have found a definite place in India's strategic outlook, whether in the context of the neighborhood first policy or its Indo-Pacific vision. Nationalism, pragmatism, and idealism, all these permeated Mr. Subramaniam's writings and pronouncements. His ability to synthesize political, economic, and military issues was legendary. He encouraged scholars to go beyond the usual shibboleths. Today, his imprimatur runs deep from India's nuclear posture to higher defense management. Today's lecture will be delivered, as I mentioned uh, earlier, by Dr. Edward N. Lutwak, who is well known, uh, very well known, as one of uh, the finest strategic thinkers in the world. Uh, his CV has been distributed beforehand, and I will therefore not go into the details. Suffice it to say that there is no better person than he, a famed realist himself, to speak on the topic applying the case Subramaniam method today. I think I have now set the tone for Dr. Lutwak's lecture. Uh, we all eagerly look forward to his remarks. I now request him to deliver his lecture over the next 40 minutes or so, after which I will request him to take a few questions as well. The floor is yours, Dr. Lutwak. Questions uh, may please be sent in the Q&A box at the bottom right corner of your screens. Thank you all very much. Over to you, Dr. Lutwak. Uh, may I please request you to unmute yourself? Yes, thank you very much you. for this uh, very uh, this excellent introduction. So let me just rush into this uh, without further ado. Um, I don't actually remember when I first met Krishna Swami Subramaniam. I suspect it may have been in 1975 because Kissinger was still in office. I was then working for his uh, rival, who he was soon defeat, uh, Dr. James Schlesinger, defense, um, the Secretary of Defense. So he arrives, and he is extremely unfamiliar to me because I had, I was educated in, in uh, I was in London, I was in London School of Economics, and I'd met the sort of Oxbridge ICS type Indians, and then playboys from Bombay, slick, uh, Playboys, West End the guys in London. And there he arrives, and he has this very thick accent uh, relative to them. And he is sort of exotic in his own manner and stuff. So and then the surprise is the moment he started speaking, he was almost terrifyingly familiar. He spoke, his mind was functioning like my father's, my grandfather's mind, exactly the same way. He starts speaking, and it is the voice of an inexorable logic. The logic. This is a linear logic. The one that comes from a background, a family background, an ancestral background, of the book, of the text, then the chapter, then the verse, and then the word. It is a sort of... A philological, that's why they call philology the queen of the sciences, because it leads to this sort of linear, inexorable logic. And the conversation, which may or may not have taken place at that time, but took place at some time within, 
was when he explained to me, and I must have been the thousand person he explained that, the logic of India having a nuclear weapon. It will be a nuclear weapon, therefore already born too powerful to be useful, exceeding the culminating point of utility. But this weapon will be accompanied by a strict no first use policy. And secondly, given these, there was no question of aping the Americans and the Russians and talking about the thousand missiles and 600 this and 700 bombers. Even if the means had been available, it would have been absurd for the purpose. And the purpose was to change the conflictuality with Pakistan, China then being absent from the world scene, and to reduce the level of fighting between India and Pakistan from big wars to small wars by creating the nuclear threshold. And to which he then added, very shockingly, that the counterpart would be a Pakistani minimum deterrent, also no first use, and also very small and limited and so on. This, so these were the whole series of shocking statements in Washington where the central policy was non-proliferation. However, there was no answer to this inexorable logic because at the time, the, the wars between India and Pakistan were large-scale wars that were extremely costly and which then were followed by rearmament efforts that were even more costly and which could always get out of hand, partly because of the large Muslim population, all kinds of factors. And therefore, his logic was not, in fact, refutable. Now, the other thing about him was that he was clear that he was extraordinarily influential. He was introduced to me as Mr. Strategy already then, and that is a hell of a long time ago, like 45 years ago. Here's it, here's the person. And it was extremely, it was part of his mental clarity and lucidity that he never tried to go into politics because his role was to provide that beam of light, that inexorable logic, that beam of light, and then politicians who had to negotiate day to day they had to explain themselves to people who don't have the beam of light. That, and manage it, the politicians would be able to follow the beam of light. And he, therefore, had this role. He had it in regard to nuclear policy. His prediction came out completely correct. He absolutely was, a, it was a, like 100% spot on, which is not easy to do when you are talking about the future and you're talking about two different countries, not just one, two of them, saying this is how it's going to be, this is how it should be, don't stand in the way, don't babble to me about non-proliferation. This has to do with containing wars which are large-scale wars, large-scale wars that can also get out of hand in many different ways. The second thing that was uh, uh, very, uh, made a great impression on me at the time or was his, uh, sorry, was not in 1975. It was had to be much later, but I forget the date. He says to me one day, when there was no, the current conflictuality between the United States and, India and China did not exist. He says, the Chinese are going to pick themselves up. This had to be after Mao's death. But when things were still in the air, it had to be like 1979, 1980, something or so. So the Chinese will, once the Mao incubus is gone, the Chinese will revert to being Chinese. Chinese are good at business. And China will develop an economy. Look at Hong Kong, look at Singapore. If there's going to be a very big Hong Kong and Singapore, then the Americans eventually are going to be outmatched by Chinese numbers. The only way they can square this equation is if the United States is aligned with India, India has the numbers, we are we can backward in every possible thing, but the fact is that we have the numbers, and already then there was this sort of rise of a certain talented Indian on the scene, even as far as Silicon Valley in those days, and he anticipated the necessity of an alliance, not in the realm of strategy or war, but precisely in what you evoked the geoeconomic struggle. Not, uh, we are now facing many other kinds of struggles, but the geoeconomic struggle between this future China, which he anticipated might go the way of Hong Kong and Taiwan, because that was already 
in the cards because their business had already started. And that the United States would not be able to match the China numerically unless the United States was aligned with India and there'd be a, a community. And all of this, he must have written, I do not have the text, but he must have written what he told me because he spoke it in a highly deliberate way. And I wish I remembered the date. What I do know is that it was very early on. Okay, it was before there was such a thing as a China that has a. I, well, I remember specifically that the that the GDP of China was then much lower than Japan's GDP. So you can date, you can look at the graph and find the date and so on. Little matter. Incidentally, I was so curious about Krishna Swami Subramanian's background that I went to Tamil Nadu, spent a whole month there, and uh, I was helped by the editor of the Hindu. He met, in that was then Madras, and he introduced me. He, he, he had this fellow called Balu Subramaniam, who was his Madurai reporter. He took me to a, to a Brahmins, you know, and so on. And one of them spoke excellent French. He must have been Pondicherry or something. And he sat there and he went through the kind of background which I had inferred or suspected. So actually, it followed the up, up, and then. I had other significant contacts with him in a different mode. I discovered quite, uh, I didn't have, I didn't look him up, so to speak. There was no Wikipedia. Um, suddenly we were discussing science and suddenly discovered that he actually had studied chemistry, that he had something completely missing in my mental makeup, which is the natural sciences and all of that stuff, uh, which was very, and it came out in a sort of fairly weird way because when, um, K. Anthony, Anthony became defense minister. He took over the defense ministry and uh, Subramanian, Krishnasamy Subramanian came in not as a strategic advisor, but he, when I, he invited me to come in and participate in what was a cleanup operation. It was an anti-corruption measures. It was the remaking of the ministry. They did sort of clever things like going to find replacing civil servants with civil servants from ministries that don't have a lot of money in them. Many of these civil servants were women. And uh, there he was re-engineering a ministry for the for the minister. And the there was a kind of conference at the end of this process. And he was unfortunately uh, did not feel well. He had this problem. Uh, and he asked me to del deliver his speech. So actually, at the conclusion of the big defense conference that marked Anthony's uh, sort of cleanup operation, um, I delivered his speech, uh, his words, and so on and so forth. So uh, definitely when I was asked to, to give this talk, uh, this was something that um, was hardly, it was something that I'd been sort of preparing for, for half a century. <laughs> now, the challenge today, is the new China. It's a China that India has lived with, and uh, people like yourself, uh, Sudan Chinoy, and of course, Minister Jai Shankar have come up close and so on. I myself have been a tourist in China. Since 1976, I was there when Mao died. That was in the great halls of the people because I was which I was the number two on Jay, uh, Secretary James Schlesinger visit to China. We were invited by Marshal Yachinin. And I, in subsequent years, I was I was always too lazy, too lazy, to learn um, characters, to try to acquire some sinological craft. I never too lazy to do that. However, I did visit China continuously. And therefore, I I I was actually I can say the following statement that sounds absurd, but I make the following statement: I was in China in two thousand and nine. At the Kanchang, at the conference run by the so-called Academy of Military Sciences every year, when the Vice Foreign Minister uh, Fu Yin, Han Fu Yin, that rather was then a very charming Mongol girl, in effect, he was very young and good looking, shows up and transformed, transformed, unrecognizable. She starts body languages like this. She moves her arms, you know, rigidly. The East is up. The West is down. This is when 2009 financial crisis was interpreted by them as the beginning of the famous general crisis of capitalism. 
That's it. Capitalism has these ups and downs, booms and busts. The general crisis is when they don't get up anymore. Don't get up anymore. Suddenly, the veil drops. Now, at that moment, the, from 2009 to the present, many things have happened. And one of those things that's happened is the great weakening of the United States. Because, of course, power is mass. Mass, which is people, guns, ships, aircraft, multiplied cohesion. cohesion, And social and cultural change in the United States, plus the accidental presidency of Trump, plus the reactions to Trump. Let's say that Trump was unhinged. The reactions to him are unhinged and all of that stuff, mass stop, multiplied cohesion means a much weaker United States. Therefore, the United States of today is a United States that cannot be go it alone, 1990, whatever. It's a United States that would need allies. And lo and behold, we have allies. We have the Australians who become active as far back as 2009 with the famous white paper warning us all all Americans and Indians, everybody, that if we don't get together, even not only they, but New Zealand will be taken over in some way. Then at that point in time, the Prime Minister of India was otherwise engaged. In Japan, there was Naoto Khan and these people who were neutralist. They sent a delegation to Beijing for the Ministry of Defense with 50 people who signed 37 memoranda for joint training, joint this and joint that. Neutralism was in the air in Tokyo. And of course, in the Philippines, they were celebrating kicking out the Americans. The Indonesians said that, oh, there's some problem in South China Sea. We offered to mediate and so on. And what happens between that day and today, the Chinese government provides us with an alliance. They go and kick the Japanese, very soon after Han Fuyin's performance there, um, of uh, going suddenly going rigid uh, and so on, they, the Senkaku incident, which could have been an incident like that, and the Chinese themselves elevated to the stage of driving the Japanese out of neutrality. Ministry of Defense is in Beijing, comes home, very soon thereafter, they're forced back into the American alliance. The politics in Japan have changed. And so now I myself wrote a book, published a book. I wrote it in 2010, published in 2012, a book in which I said that the inexorable logic of strategy, and that's my, my not uh, Subramanian's linear logic, it's mine, it's paradoxical, it's twisting it, but it's got the same concept that it obliges and dominates politics. I said, I don't care who is the prime minister in Delhi, I don't care who's the prime minister in Tokyo. The logical strategy will force them into reshaping themselves to contain China because the power, the, the pressure from China will, will dominate whatever it is that they have in their own political process themselves. So that book came out. It had no ifs and buts, no conditions. On the other hand, it was a kind of thing that only somebody as completely convinced of himself as Krishna Swami Suramanyam could have written, except I wrote it. But I wrote it exactly in his own methodology of the inexorable logic would force his country. Now, however, the Chinese were not forced to follow that. The Japanese were forced, the Indian were forced by the Chinese. The Chinese themselves could have reflected for a moment that if you go around kicking all your neighbors, one after the other, you're going to force them into an alliance. And here's, lo and behold, the United States needs allies, and it has Japan, it has Australia, it has Vietnam, silent but very much of an ally. We have permanently one of our Coast Guard, uh, one of our Coast Guard, and they call them cutters, but they're, you know, substantial warships in the Gulf of Tonkin. And of course, India itself long ago has provided great help to Vietnam through uh, making available the submarine training facility, which is very important because you cannot, to train crews within submarines takes a long time. You have a training establishment where you can do it to shore and, and so on. This happened quite a long time ago. So what we have is a coalition, not NATO, not North Atlantic Alliance, top down, Americans and British design it and the others all forced into their very slots. This is organic, it's spontaneous. And elements of it were built 
it's a whole pile up, it's an overlapping bilateral arrangements. The Australian Vietnamese intelligence dialogue, which slowly becomes more important. The relationship between um, India, and, and, uh, India and Japan that is formed by the fact that it was accel was driven by China, but accelerated by the by the fortuitous and very unfortunate fact that the two protagonists, Abe Shinzo and Modi, uh, Prime Minister Modi in India, had known each other even before they respectively became things. So the, out of this comes the Indo-Pacific command idea for the Americans to restructure. And of course, other components. The Filipinos celebrated kicking out the Americans finally. Now then the Filipinos bring them back to Manila Bay. The Indonesians who want to be neutral end up by putting helicopters with anti-ship missiles on the Tuna Island and uh, proclaim that anybody who tries to sort of uh, probe themselves, they're going to attack them. So here are the Indonesians. The Malaysians continue with their deep sleep. Um, the poor Chinese were reduced to the expedient of sending some warship off the coast of Malaysia and doing a television show on CCTV saying, we are here in, in these waters, they belong to China, they don't belong to Malaya. And even that didn't wake them up. But what we have here is the logic of strategy working itself out, creating this organic alliance. And the worst possible thing in my view would be to try and superimpose some artificial structure. I don't even like the quad very much because it does not include uh, our Vietnamese ally, and for other reasons. Um, but evidently, uh, this is the kind of thing that that uh, gives us a task, a problem, and a task, and so on. And I, I would like to uh, address one issue which I am working on now all the time. This issue are the borders of China. China is a country that is acting as if it were an island power, as if it were England, um, I mean, Great Britain or Japan, because it's putting all its effort in maritime forces, strategic forces, air forces. It has an army of less than a million. It has abolished its border guards, its border force, they used to be 300,000. And its People's Armed Police is no longer available for anything because the Xi Jinping's own particular contribution, which is the abolition of the formula, national inform socialist or communist in content, he wants, he wants to abolish the national inform. He has revoked this policy that Stalin very wisely initiated in Russia of upholding nationalities, supporting them, providing cultural investments for them, and and instead to annihilate the nationalities. That is, uh, the, sh the, the children of Uyghur should be speaking Mandarin. Pozunghua should not speak Uyghur. The Kazakh children in Xinjiang, the same. The Tibetans must be denatured de by being removed from their occupation as herdsmen, turned into workers. But, and, and the Mongols, the Mongols, they revoke Mongol education. So the Mongol teachers can only teach Mongolian, no longer, et cetera. All of this means that the People's Armed Police is now absorbed within the Chinese territory. So at the borders of China, there's nobody on the borders of China. With an army of less than a million, with no, the border force abolished. So this is the moment for this alliance, this alliance to start sort of being present on the borders of China. If you patrol those borders, they have to counter patrol. And those borders are sort of long. You know, they, in fact, the world's longest borders by far. Just the Mongol Chinese border is 4,000 kilometers. So this is the moment to look at borders. Maritime powers, and India is a maritime power. When maritime powers are confronted by land power that builds navies, builds maritime power, what the maritime powers do is that they act on the borders of the land power to remind the land power that it is a land power. And land powers have to look after the borders. So this works very well for the, for unambiguously well for the Americans and for the Japanese and some 
to attract the Chinese onto land borders. It will work on behalf of India as well, insofar as they do not crowd on the near uh, 3,800 kilometers of, of borders they have with India, and they start having to patrol all the other borders. However, it is a fact that any Indian government uh, would wish that if there's going to be any fighting, it be done somewhere else other than the Indian borders. That is understandable, and nobody. And uh, I, I see how there's no eagerness to get into this line of business. But there's also the possibility that the other side, that is the Chinese, that is Xi Jinping in reality, because these days when the Standing Committee of the Central Committee, Standing Committee of the Politburo meets. They all studiously are reading the text with their heads down, and nobody speaks. So we're not dealing with China. We're dealing with one man. We're dealing with a peculiar man, somebody who worships Mao Zedong, the person who sent his father very personally, very personally, sent him to prison for 18 years or 17, humiliated his mother from the streets of Beijing, killed his half-sister from starvation, and the other only survived because the so-called King of Mongolia passed some food to her. Uh, the Secretary General and so on. This fellow should hate Mao Zedong, worships Mao Zedong, and he has other peculiarities. And one of his peculiarities is now his Mussolini face. He's now in his Mussolini face. Children, when there are little school parades now in Beijing, children who wear glasses are not allowed to be visible. They're not to be in the front. They have to be hidden inside the mask. This is Mussolini. He equipped little Italians with little wooden rifles and uniforms. He was trying to turn Italians into warriors. And Mr. Xi Jinping is trying to do the same, trying to turn into warriors. They're celebrating the heroes. And the fact that you have a demography where you have uh, uh, the inability to recruit anybody for the ground forces that is in any way accomplished, you have the fact of um, uh, no power in history has ever fought with an army composed of single children. No country in the world has fought a war so far, anyway, with an army where the, every soldier is the single child and is the end of two families in his body. So he has all these little problems, and he's, he deals with his problems, Mr. Xi Jinping, by giving long talks about the need for combat readiness to be really ready for fight, truly to fight, and so on. By the way, American combat readiness means having batteries and all the equipment you need as spare parts. So he's talking about Mussolini combat, readiness to fight, be a lion, don't be a sheep, and all that stuff. This kind of thing eventuates in some form of conflict. He's looking for his opportunity, and that opportunity is could occur anywhere. So um, my final comments, and I like to don't to be uh, to have maximum time for Q's and A's and answers, and I hope to hear from the minister who is gracing us with his presence, notwithstanding parliamentary obligation. Here's the following When you're faced with an enemy who might attack you, you have to get serious. And serious means discipline, and it means the willingness to sacrifice beloved and cherished things. In the United States, the, the Army, Navy, and Air Force were diggling along with separate and mutually competitive non-cooperative missile programs until Sputnik came out. So 11 years after the end of a destructive war, this backward country called Russia launches a missile. Then the Americans straighten up. Suddenly, they, they instead of Army, Navy, and Air Force fighting each other, they started there and they were able to make rockets and so on. When you're facing with a strategic challenge, this is the opportunity for reform drastic reforms. So I'm going to just throw out the ones that Krishna Swami Subramanian would declare this evening. Now, first, the Chinese army is maybe 970,000, something of the sort. The Indian army is 1.3. India also has at least uh, as many, maybe more paramilitaries, some very good, some not so good, but still plenty of them, plus a million. This is the moment to reduce the army, maintain the budget and reduce the numbers or increase the budget or increase the budget and reduce the numbers in order to have a very agile army which has plenty of 
of his fuel and spare parts to be able to operate and be high ransom. Now, the American cult of readiness is a foolish cult because readiness is like cut flowers. You have to buy it every day. You're very ready today. Tomorrow, you're not. So, you know, they overdo it enormously, the, the Americans in the armed forces. But there's a possibility of being a sensible kind of readiness. This calls for a smaller, more agile army with more capital and so on. The second thing has to do with the Navy. The Indian Navy feels obliged to have an aircraft carrier. They spend all their money on an aircraft carrier. When I look at the map, India is an aircraft carrier. The only thing is that the Navy should be not only empowered, but funded to buy aircraft all around India, Andaman, Nicobar Islands, flying with torpedoes, with mines, and dominate the entry to the Persian Gulf, dominate the entry to the Suez Canal, dominate the Straits of Malacca by having multiplicity of missiles and aircraft and so on, which cost about the same cost as one single aircraft carrier, which is one hull, which is vulnerable, which has a very limited number of combat aircraft that can stop. Just because the Americans worship at the altar of this 1945 war-winning weapon, the 1945 war-winning weapon, it is a fact that war-winning weapons r rule until the next war. But the aircraft carrier is an ancient thing, and to have the whole of Indian naval power, the Indian Navy has shown itself to be an excellent service. In all the joint maneuvers, I only hear positive things about the Indian Navy's officers and so on. But if the Indian Navy's money is spent on an aircraft carrier, just because the aircraft carrier was once the, the capital ship, which today, of course, is the nuclear-powered submarine, attack submarine is the capital ship, it, this, you can't, we can't afford that. Once Sputnik rises, you have to get serious. And here, to, to dominate the Chinese, because... There are all these silly stories, and I will end on this note. We have now a new phenomenon in America, hysterical generals, hysterical admirals. The hysterical generals talk about hypersonic weapons, which was a 1969 technology, only useful if your ballistic missile defense is to underfly. So to make a big fuss about them, it's just sort of silly. And we have the issue of the Taiwan scenario where the Chinese sink an American aircraft carrier. Maybe two, why not? The fact is that to this day, nobody knows who won the Battle of Jutland in 1916. It was the German battleships and the British battle cruisers. We don't know, and it doesn't matter, because blockade started on the first day in August 1914. By August, by September, by the winter of 1917, the Germans were suffering malnutrition, malnutrition. China has got wonderful attributes other than their complete strategic imbecility. And it is a sub, sub you know, footnote mystery why Kissinger goes around saying they're great strategies when 1600 years they kept being defeated by three guys on horseback who ruled them for 200, for two centuries. I don't know why he says that. But the fact is that today we have a China which has changed and which needs to have hundreds of bulk carriers in its ports on a continuous basis of bulk carriers. These bulk carriers originate in places like Australia, where they'll be stopped the moment there's any fighting, let alone sinking aircraft carriers. No more bulk carriers leave Australia. Other bulk carriers come from the Persian Gulf, which, of course, India can close anytime it wants. The Americans can close it. Almost anybody can close the Persian Gulf, even the Persians, I mean, uh, can close the Persian Gulf. Or you would have things like iron ore coming from Brazil. Well, it's a hell of a long way from Brazil. Let's assume the Chinese dominate the space 1,000 miles, 2,000 miles, 3,000 miles. Never mind. You just stop it. Uh, even if the Brazilians don't do it, you do it. In other words, blockade is the answer to anything. And therefore, all these tactical scenarios are irrelevant. We need clarity and see how these things develop. Why am I talking about war? Not because I believe war is appropriate. I think geoeconomics is appropriate. The geoeconomic struggle is appropriate. But unfortunately, Xi Jinping may be in his Mussolini moment when he wants to look around and show that the Chinese can fight. Now, they could do tai Taiwan, but in Taiwan, they have the very unpredictable Americans. 
And there is the question of the blockade. So therefore, that is why I would wish that the Indian army were reformed very, very fast to be able to counter that and to counter seize because you cannot defend a border of 3,488 kilometers at 470 for Bhutan. You can't defend. So the only two choices, retaliation if they attack and inflict casualties and grabbing where it suits you, not where it suits them. They push ahead in Ladakh, you advance in Arunachal or the other way, that sort of thing, for which you need an agile, responsive army. I will end like this in the middle, and i be very happy to respond to comments, complaints, etc. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lutwak, uh, for walking us through your own views about the new China and uh, touching upon very important issues like the concept of organic alliances. Uh, you also outlined your views on China's military and its borders, uh, uh, the borders of others. Uh, and um, perhaps uh, uh, you uh, may have left out the point that the PLA uh, also now counts the PAP among its ranks, uh, that the Coast Guard is part of the PLA Navy, the fishing militia is part of you know, the Coast Guard and so on and so forth. So the numbers really add up. Uh, I think you also quite succeeded in bringing together a bit of Mahan and Makinda uh, in uh, trying to suggest uh, response levels, uh, whether continental, heartland base or maritime. Uh, but then one might also say that the Chinese are using the Belt and Road Initiative to also do a bit of, uh, uh, you know, a combination of Mahan and Makinda themselves. But I leave it to you to judge that. Uh, but I think you uh, ended on this uh, very important note uh, of the importance of, uh, uh, you know, readiness to sacrifice, to protect one's interests. Uh, and that readiness is extremely important. I don't think it's found wanting in the case of India at all. Um, I will at this stage read out to you, if you permit, uh, a couple of questions uh, and uh, request you to uh, express your views. We have uh, Ambassador Skan Tayal uh, asking, why is President uh, Biden uh, not following uh, the linear logic of China being uh, the main future adversary uh, and pushing uh, China in the Chinese embrace? Even on Ukraine, uh, President Biden is more belligerent than President Zelensky. Uh, that's the first question. May I read out uh, one or two more? Yeah, can I answer that question? All right, we'll go one by yeah. one. Yes, first of all, you will, you will have noticed, as Minister Joshua undoubtedly knows in great detail, that when Biden came in, he changed many things that Trump had done. The only thing he didn't touch was China policy. There was 100% continuity, and the Trump-China policy was premised on the fact that China was the antagonist, and therefore, a whole range of belated measures to protect our technology, belated reactions, and so on, all of them came under Trump. Um, and not Obama, because Obama only realized the nature of the beast uh, very late. In fact, it was when Xi Jinping came to Washington in 2015, just before the end of the administration. Trump instituted the focus that China is the antagonist, we have to deal with China. He introduced the technology controls. It was the discovery that Huawei had lied to Xi Jinping and to the world and boasted about all these very advanced microprocessors. In reality, they had nothing. All of the technology was ARM, Cambridge, England, American, so. So Trump focused on China very strongly. And Biden, what does Biden do? He revises many Trump policies, not China policy, with his perfect continuity. In fact, the China fellow at the NSC, Matt Pottinger, well-known person, uh, he was uh, recalled many times for consultation, perfect continuity and extension. Also, um, the FBI uh, beginning to contain the flow of technology and so on, in spite of the fact that uh, in American universities, the Republic of MIT, for example, does not participate in the control of technology and so on. But we have, are focusing on China. Now, in regard to Ukraine, 
The situation in regard to Ukraine is that we have a, a fantastical belief that Putin has suddenly become an adventurer who will invade Europe's largest country with a puny force of 125,000. He's doing intimidation. Regrettably, there were our intelligence community became like hysterical nervous Nellies, and therefore there was this unfortunate events and so on. But the fact is that this Ukraine thing is not something that removes one atom of strength vis-a-vis -vis China. Remember, Ukraine has to do with anti-tank tanks, possibly, possibly this, possibly that. But what we deal in regard to China is the maritime forces. And whatever is left in the Atlantic, uh, on the Atlantic side is much more than enough to deal with any Russian, Ukrainian or Baltic scenario. So nothing gets pulled away from the continuing flow of resources in the Indo-Pacific. Whatever Ukraine is, it is definitely a policy distraction, but it is not a diversion of means. Thank you. Uh, in a similar vein, uh, Mr. Ravi Velur of the Strait Times in Singapore, who is listening in from Singapore, uh, he uh, says that the way Washington is handling Russia and Ukraine against the backdrop of uh, this obsession with, uh, with Russia uh, and, and not with the systemic rival that is China, uh, uh, does that further cement uh, you know, the impression that the U.S. is... Uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, the U.S. kind of feels that the Sino-Russia concord uh, is moving so rapidly that there's no stopping it. For else, why would the United States uh, yeah. okay. do it? So uh, we've all seen pictures. We've all seen pictures of Xi Jinping and Putin kissing each other, hugging, maybe getting married. You know, these things happen these days. And it is, must be a coincidence, it must be a coincidence that the principal supplier of weapons to, to Vietnam, which is a country that fights the Chinese, happens to be Russian Federation. And it is also a coincidence that when I was in Delhi, just very recently, there was a huge Russian delegation arriving, offering the best of the best to India. That must be a coincidence. It must, and it's also very coincidental that at the Nestle Coy Navy University in Vladivostok, they teach that every Chinese territorial claim that is not actively advanced is dormant. Why would the Russian university in, in the maritime provinces publish a book on Chinese frontiers, in which they describe claims not advanced as dormant? In other words, the, the Americans, even, even the most provincial people in Washington understand that the long-term future, if we drop the ball a few more times, might be a future where we allied with Russia, or rather helping the Russians preserve their territorial integrity versus China. If we all, if India, Japan, United States, we all fool around, we all fail, this is what will happen at the end. Right now, the United States has to respond on Ukraine because Mr. Putin has already got Abkhazia, fell into his hands, and then South Ossetia, and then Crimea, and then there was an upheaval in Kazakhstan. During that upheaval, Russian troops were called in. There were very few. They stayed only a few days, but this reestablishes a suzerainty that will only be revoked if Kazakh troops are called to Moscow. So this is a, Putin has the, with the economy of Italy, Putin is operating an active and revisionist great power which the United States is responding to with very tiny means, like a few thousand rockets, a few things, very small means, a lot of media, a lot of noise, but the act, the strength is going to the Indo-Pacific. That's where the resources are. Marine Corps is still in the process of completely moving out from Middle East and Europe to be only there. The resources are still flowing in the Pacific. Just the television time is going on Ukraine. That is, let's look at the reality of the forces. Do not consider, do not think for a moment that there is a diversion of anything important going on. Well, thank you for that uh, reassuring note. Uh, Mr. Dinesh Chandra uh, asks, does the new axis between Marxist China and uh, a radicalized Pakistan 
not make it logical for the United States and India to lead the defense of the democratic world against this common threat? Well, you know, the, the American-Pakistani story has gone through many evolutions, but um, at this moment, as you know, um, the dance of the seven veils is all over. Pakistan is unambiguously viewed as a power that was hostile to the United States, actively hostile through. There was the uh, contradictory situation that to, to have logistics out of Karachi port while you were you were fighting people empowered by the Pakistanis and all of this sort of giant thing has now resolved itself. And um, now American policy is, is a, the Pakistani lobby in American foreign policy is now shrunk to a couple of people who have a very limited, um, you know, time left on their clocks. And we have got, and you know, I believe that it will be an understood proposition that the U.S. relations with Pakistan should be conducted within the context of a de facto Indo-American alliance. And so the United States will deal with Pakistan separately than India, but it will not do so in contrast to India and with a certain deference to Indian priorities. This is going to, is going to be increasingly accepted. In fact, attempts by the Pakistanis immediately after the, the Kabul debacle, debacle, you know, the irony that Biden proclaimed the Afghan army a fraud as far back as 2009, and then he being penalized politically because the fraud turned out to be not only 90% fraud, but 100%, et cetera, et cetera. In that context, um, President Biden is a good president to inaugurate a new phase in, in, the, in U.S. Pakistani relations where uh, uh, you deal with Pakistan with Delhi, not parallel even, and not against. This is this is the season where this is going to happen. Uh, thank you. I'm conscious of the time constraints and the fact that uh, uh, Dr. Jashankar uh, will also, like you, have other things to do. Uh, but we will take two more questions, and thereafter I am actually closing the Q&A session. Um, uh, the next question is Dr. Uday Bhanu Singh of our institute. Uh, he refers to your practical handbook on coups uh, wow. and asks, do you think the coup in Myanmar a year ago was a miscalculation? First of all, the coup d'etat book, I'm very proud, is out in 29 languages, was a useful indiscretion. I was 21 or 20 when I wrote it, you know, so I don't really want to defend it. But in regard to Myanmar, this is an example of how this alliance must work. Um, the United States has levied some 56 different sanctions on Myanmar. India, on Japan, on the other hand, it continues. Uh, Myanmar was actually Burma was the first recipient of Japanese ODA, which continues. The 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 Japanese are the ones who can continue to support Myanmar and start building out the frontier force for Myanmar that will cause the, the Chinese to counter patrol. And we start this process of drawing the Chinese away from the sea back on land through not allowing them to treat these borders, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the case where the Japanese understand. And I have just spoken, in fact, with the Japanese government in that regard. I can say this publicly because it's no secret. The Japanese will do will work there because they are advantaged. Just like if we do anything with Tajikistan, I certainly hope that we will defer to the Indian government because India has a well-established position in Tajikistan, even has physical assets there. And so this is how this alliance works. Not, this is not different allies pitching to do things that they're very strong at. I mean, Bangladesh is another one. India is inhibited there. The United States is inhibited. And it is the number one recipient of Japanese overseas assistance. It doesn't have those frontline characteristics, but you know, I can see how this sort of thing works. But if Washington does not understand that in regard to Pakistan, you you can do anything you want so long as you check for Delhi. If they continue not to understand that, this is something where the Indian side can be entitled to do a bit of Krishna Swami Subramaniam on that. 
The very last question is from Captain Anurag Bisen of the Indian Navy, uh, who is with us uh, at our institute. Uh, he uh, wishes to know your views on the possibility of Russia and China acting in tandem to act uh, on Ukraine and Taiwan simultaneously. And what happens to US's Indo-Pacific strategy in that case? Well, the Russians can contribute almost nothing to Taiwan scenarios out of Vladivostok. If they were to move out of Vladivostok in a hostile way, uh, it would be something fairly straightforward to neutralize whatever they're doing. Um, if they might want to bring the fleet from the Baltic all the way around uh, Africa and so on to emulate what they did in 1905, but, you know, by the time the ships arrive, they will be in need of medical help and so on, that kind of stuff. So there's no scenario where you have Russians and Chinese cooperating on Taiwan. In, you know, in, in Taiwan, look, between Taiwan and Amoy or Xiamen, as it's called, uh, the water is very shallow, submarines cannot operate. However, uh, even though the Taiwanese do the minimum possible to defend themselves, and they, in fact, would not deserve defense given how little they do. Nevertheless, attacking an island, even those conditions is sort of difficult. And to protect an island is relatively easy to do. Um, so that's not a field for cooperation. In fact, now, in regard to, the, to things like the Chinese operating in the Baltic, that would be, you know, a projection that is very, very far, operating in the North Atlantic also. So these two countries, are, in my view, are not strategic allies. I think they play tactical games together. They, If they were strategic allies, they this delegation would not have been in Delhi when I was in Delhi trying to sell every damn thing they had, uh, and including the latest and best Sukhoi version. So. Thank you very much. Uh, may I now request uh, Dr. S. Jaishankar to share his views with us. I wish to make it clear that he's uh, with us today uh, as uh, uh, a family member of uh, Mr. K. Subramanyam. Uh, and uh, I now invite him to uh, deliver his remarks. Uh, thank you for joining us, uh, despite your busy schedule. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sujan. And let me really begin by appreciating the efforts of the Institute of Defense Studies and Analysis. Uh, as the memorial lecture, I think something which is very fitting and Ruva will speak for the family, but I assure you we appreciate it very much. Uh, I uh, was very good of Professor Dr. Lutwak as well to accept IDSA's invitation uh, to deliver the lecture. Uh, and uh, Dr. Lutwak, of course, has uh, his way of uh, looking at the world and uh, 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 even more unique way of expressing that. Uh, and. Uh, uh, what, uh, of course, uh, many of the issues uh, that he has brought up in the course of his talk are issues of contemporary import, and I, I have some thoughts on it, but I don't think today is the occasion to, uh, to dwell on it. What I would like to do, though, uh, is perhaps make two or three observations uh, regarding K. Subramaniam, uh, in whose memory the lecture has been held. Uh, as someone who, in a way, being in the same line of business over many, many years, other than a uh, family relationship, uh, uh, I think gave me uh, insights into his mind and his, as uh, Dr. Lutwak uh, described it, his methodology. Uh, I think the most important uh, thing to note about him was that he was actually very profoundly shaped by the uh, conflicts of 1962, 1965, of 1971, and 1999. Shaped both in his thinking and in many ways, I would say, uh, emotionally uh, as well. Uh, in fact, uh, my last uh, memory of him, physical memory of him, was actually uh, uh, a few months before he died when uh, he was discussing with Dhruva uh, the uh, 1965 war and how the outcome hung in balance uh, uh, at one point of time. But the point to note is that, you know, a lot of what he said, what he wrote, what he advocated, 
was a product of a very tough strategic environment that India faced at that time. An environment in which Pakistan, China, and for a significant part of his life, the United States all came together. Uh, so uh, for that reason, actually, in the 70s, he was a very strong advocate of the Soviet relationship. And then decades later, as you know, he could see contradictions between uh, US and China, he became a very strong advocate of the American relationship. Uh, and uh, I remember once, uh, you know, meeting uh, uh, a common uh, boss of ours, Ambassador uh, A.P. Venkateshwara uh, in the India International Center. And uh, Venkat asked my father saying, you know, you used to be, uh, Subhu, you used to be such a strong Soviet advocate. What happened to you? You're now advocating relationship with the U.S. To which my father's reply really was, well, the logic of it is the same. You know, that, you know, the, the, the world has changed, but the logic of what I am trying to do, which is really uh, work to, to uh, secure India's interests, uh, takes me in a very uh, different direction. The second observation, uh, of course, I would have is that in many ways, he was unique in Delhi, in India, uh, as, a, as a sort of insider-outsider. You know, he was a government servant. He served in the ministry, in the defense ministry, in intelligence, and yet in in an institute, in your institute, uh, and uh, he, and this role of an insider outsider was a was something which uh, which was uh, very singular uh, to him. Uh, there were times when it would actually make him go against the government of the day. Uh, I remember in the 70s, for example, when a large part of our nuclear establishment believed that Pakistan could not make nuclear weapons. He had a contrary view. He was one of the earliest people to write about the very strong collaboration between China and Pakistan uh, on the nuclear uh, front. But equally, when he wrote in public, because he had an insider's insight, he was also very responsible. You know, and uh, a lot of what he wrote on the nuclear uh, options and its exercise, uh, I think, recognized the constraints and the challenges which the government of the day faced. So, you know, you had people making far more sweeping, uh, you know, pronouncements on what we should be doing, you know, take on the world sort of thing. And I think he was a far, you know, he, he was uh, much more sober in in how to uh, approach this challenge. And my final comment would be really about his last years, I would say the last uh, uh, decade, maybe a decade and a half, where, uh, you know, I, I, I think they, uh, he, he, he was in many ways a sort of grand strategist, certainly that's how he saw himself. Uh, the nuclear issue, I know, was a sort of larger than life association with him. Jack Suraya had the term bomb mama uh, uh, for him. but. Uh, as he focused more on the changing world, which Edward also mentioned, a world of much more geoeconomics, uh, uh, he, I, I, he was uh, his own writings. He actually headed a task force as well for the government about non-traditional power. Uh, that you know the issues we are grappling with today: connectivity, technology, financing. You know, how these can be used to leverage and shape international relations. I think these were very much his uh, big issues in the uh, last uh, decade and a half of his life. In that sense, I think he was a bit ahead of his time. He certainly, today, if he was with us, he would uh, say, aha, see, I, I told you some of these things were, were going to uh, happen. So uh, these were some of the thoughts which came to my mind as I was listening to the lecture once again. I, I thank you, Sudan, personally, to the Institute, uh, to Dr. Lutwak uh, uh, for the event today. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. I think you thank had you. the privilege of uh, relating to Mr. K. Subramaniam both as a family member as well as a professional. And I think that is a very unique privilege that you had. Um, I now turn to uh, Mr. Dhruva Jayashankar uh, to kindly deliver the vote of thanks.
uh, Ambassador Shnoy, uh, and you know, I, I I don't have too much to add uh, to to what has been said, uh, and my job is in fact quite simple, and I'll I'll keep it quite uh, brief. Uh, as many of you know, uh, K. Subramaniam was, uh, I mean, uh, an institution builder. He played many roles in government, out, outside of government, uh, pioneered many things. Uh, but he also was, uh, you know, ha- he had a family, and it's on behalf of the family that I, I speak here today. Uh, his uh, his wife, Salochna, uh, my grandmother, passed away a little over a year and a half ago, uh, and uh, may- may- many of you also uh, uh, knew her. Uh, and of course, he had uh, you know four children, six uh, grandchildren, and now uh, four great grandchildren as well. And so, it's on behalf of all of them that I, I want to give my thanks to to two people and institutions. Uh, the first, of course, is to IDSA, um, an institution that uh, my grandfather had a long association with in two stints, uh, first starting in 1968 and again in the 1980s. Um, and it was an institution that was very dear to him. He he helped build it up. Uh, it not, he was not there. Actually, he was slightly there at the genes- genesis. He was the note taker at the meetings at which the, the foundation of IDSA was discussed, in fact, uh, by the then defense secretary and defense minister uh, in the early 1960s. Uh, but he, he really joined after in 1968, uh, after it had been set up and established. Um, uh, if For those of you who are interested, he, he wrote about the establishment of IDSA and some of the, the challenges and evolutions of that institution uh, subsequently, including in a 2005 volume uh, that IDSA produced, uh, edited by Narendra Sisodia and, and Sujan Chinoy. So um, uh, I, I would uh, highly recommend uh, that uh, if for those who, are, who, who might be interested. Um, uh, so my, my first, my thanks to uh, IDSA for putting this on, uh, to the Director General uh, and uh, to his uh, staff. Thanks again. This is the second uh, case of Romanian Memorial Lecture uh, that has been held, and hopefully we, this, this becomes an annual tradition. Uh, my second uh, thanks, of course, is to our uh, keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Edward Lutwak, who is somebody I've also uh, long had an association with and, and uh, have always been uh, challenged and, and intrigued by his th- and enriched by his observations on any number of issues. And I'm, I'm thank you for sharing your, uh, your observations uh, today. Uh, one of the things for, for many of you who, who may not be as familiar is uh, the, the 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 wide range of issues that Dr. Lutwak has commented on on in in a variety of formats uh, that has is really quite breathtaking in its sweep, uh, and uh, also you know a reflection as as he mentioned my grandfather's personal journey uh, reflected his worldview. Similarly, Dr. Lutwak's personal journey in some ways is a ref- re- reflects his his worldview. So I have in some ways three thanks to give to him. Uh, one uh, he which he would appreciate. One. Uh, uh, as a Kosanam in in uh, he, he, uh, oh. Dr. Dr. Lutwak, uh, his first language was uh, Hungarian in, in Magyar in, in some ways, and uh, it was kind of where he, he, he sort of his his genesis. Uh, the second one is Grazie, is he turned to he he grew up in Italy, and uh, in some ways that uh, also informed his thinking in many ways. And the uh, analogies, whether it's Mussolini or uh, the Roman Empire, uh, do do still influence his, his way of thinking. Uh, and finally, Toda Raba, which is uh, another oh, place that uh, Hebrew, Hebrew. which he um, is uh, uh, has also uh, greatly shaped his worldview, uh, and from whom uh, he he does impart lessons uh, that that uh, apply very much to today to India's strategic situation as well. So, uh, a, a, a great thanks. Uh, before I uh, end, um, amongst the many other things. Uh, his his work on uh, uh, coup d'état, practical handbook was mentioned. His book on strategy has been mentioned. The grand strategy of the Roman Empire, but also in many ways, if one were to go back and read Dr. Lutwak's uh, works uh, in the London Review of Books, for example, over many years, you see many things that, uh, like my grandfather w- wrote, uh, were in many ways ahead of his time. And uh, uh, for example, an article he wrote in 1994, uh, what, what many of us now think of as uh, the peak unipolar moment, called "Why Fascism Is a." Is the wave of the future, uh, and if you read that today, uh, it, it's, it's very much an article that could have been written as much in, in 2017, 2018 as it could have been in in 1994. Uh, if uh, so, on, on any number of issues, whether it's on Napoleon's wars, whether it's on uh, the Byzantine Empire, uh, uh, there, there are lessons that uh, uh, Dr. Lutwak's wide grasp of history and uh, uh, immense uh, knowledge and and, great, and and wide interests. Uh, have been sort of brought to bear on, on, on any number of pressing issues. And today he brought them to some of 
the issues that are dominating uh, our collective minds uh, today. So with that, uh, on again, on behalf of uh, uh, Case of Romania's family, a great thanks uh, to IDSA, uh, to Ambassador Sudam Chinoy, and, and uh, to Dr. Lutvaka, our speaker today. Thank you. Thank you very much. So once again, thank you uh, on behalf of the uh, Institute. I wish to thank uh, Dr. Edward uh, Lutwak, uh, Dr. S. Jayashankar, and Mr. Dhruva Jayashankar for uh, sparing their time to be with us today. And we hope you will join us again uh, next year, uh, perhaps uh, around the same time uh, for this uh, uh, memorial lecture that we want to ensure is an annual uh, memorial lecture. Uh, we owe it to Mr. K. Subramanyam uh, to do that. Uh, thank you all very much. And from this side, wish you good health. Good day. Thank you very much. Namaste.